Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 110, otherwise known as season six, episode 11. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is your other host, Jacob Davison. How are you doing, Jacob? Uh, doing well. Good to be back and ready to talk about all the movies I've been watching. Uh, yeah, let's we'll, we'll get started, but not before we introduce your other other host, John Korea. How are you doing, Korea? I'm doing good, but I had a concerning event happen in the last week. Oh, and man. so, you know, when you're like when you're when it's the evening, right? And, and, and all your work is done and you and you look through your collection, you're like, what am I going to watch tonight? And, you know, if you're if, if you're a collector like me or just or just even with all the streaming stores, there's a lot of choices and it's and it's overwhelming sometimes. And. I, I am accusing Jacob of of telepathic abilities and getting mm. into my head and going, watch the Giver. You have to watch <laughs> the Giver because I don't I can't explain any other reason for me to just pull that one off the shelf and watch the Giver for the first time. Um, so, Jacob, that was terrifying that you did that. But thank <laughs> you, because the Giver yeah. is so much fucking fun. Like it's Brian Usna produced, co-directed by Screaming uh, Mad George. And it's got Mark Hamill in it. It's got um, Jeffrey Combs plays Dr. East in it. Like, yeah. there's a lot of good times references, a lot more, way more than I ever yeah. thought were possible to happen in a uh, anime and, you know, live action adaptation done by the re- team behind Reanimator. But yeah, yeah, it was directed by Brian Usna. <laughs> and uh, basically, you know, they were just trying to cash in on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles craze. But uh, yeah, no, I think it's pretty fun. Like I, I, I had I remember watching it on the sci fi channel. So it's a, a movie I'm fond of. No, it, it's a it's a hell of a good time. And the sequel is a, a lot of fun, too. Oh, yeah. Dark Hero. Mostly was, for that third act with the suit fighting was incredible. Yeah, and in a UFO. So much fun. Like the first two quarters or two thirds of it feels like a 90s sci-fi original movie. But man, it's worth it. Which is funny because it played on the sci-fi channel. Yeah. Before we get started into the um, well, before we continue, I should say, because you guys already have kind of (laughs) given a guy. Before we get started into the movies we've seen, um, let's talk Barbenheimer, which is is it really horror? But I think it's worth talking about. Um, have Ooh. you guys have you guys done the Barbenheimer experience? Well, I no. I saw them on separate days, but I yeah. did see Barbie and I did see Oppenheimer. Yeah, I I did them on separate days. See, I'm a victim of what the studios did to the press, which is in most markets they screened them on the same night, and neither studio would budge. And uh... there's there there's there's speculation that Warner brothers did this purposely to Christopher Nolan because they're pissed at him, but I don't know why, but um, I had to choose and I chose Oppenheimer for the press screening because they showed it to us in 70. And as far as Oppenheimer's Mm -hmm. goes, um, I I think it's a little long. I'm stoked that Chris Nolan finally found someone who knows how to do sound or he learned a little bit about sound because the sound is amazing. And the sound for his movies is never amazing. <laughs> it's always actually really bad. It's a little long in the tooth. It, what it's about, it's about Oppenheimer and the the development of the atomic bomb. Mm-hmm. And once they do the atomic bomb test about two thirds of the way in, it's a three hour movie. So about two hours in, they test this bomb. And then from there till the end of the movie, the last hour is really good. It's just oh, yeah. getting to that, I think, is a little long. Well, I was lucky. I got to see Oppenheimer in IMAX 70 millimeter at the uh, Sid Grauman Chinese Theater. And uh, I I wasn't really sure how I was going to feel about it. But, you know, I've never felt three hours go by so fast. It was very enthralling, thanks in large part to its amazing ensemble cast. Uh, you know, because it's a thing. It is just more of a biopic. So it does focus squarely on Oppenheimer himself as a person and also his works uh, and also kind of presenting kind of the philosophical uh, repercussions of uh, what he what he did. So it uh, yeah, no, I thought it was very interesting and, and also just wild to me because, you know, the explode the Trinity test explosion was all practical. That was not CGI. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm and that IMAX sound system 
definitely made it feel that way. That's that's what Nolan does. He doesn't do CG. I mean, like if he if he wants to flip a semi, he flips a semi. If he wants mm-hmm. to crash a plane, he crashes a plane. And if he wants to, bl- I don't think he used an atomic bomb. But if he wants to simulate an atomic bomb, well, he used a bomb. <laughs> he blows some shit up. Um, you did. And and about the ensemble cast, you're totally right, because it's like it's it's how do you say it? Killian? Is it Killian Murphy? Killian Murphy. It's Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer and then Emily Blunt as his wife. And then Robert Downey Jr. is one of his cohorts. But then you're watching the movie. And you're like, oh, Florence Pugh's in this. Oh, Casey Affleck is in this. Oh, Matt Quaid. Damon is in this. You're like the whole time through people are coming through and you're like, oh, my wait, he's in this. She's in this. Yes. Yeah. Well, my favorite had to be Gary Oldman as President yeah. Truman. <laughs> yeah. Who's just a total asshole. <laughs> yeah, totally Truman. Yeah, it's yeah. Op- That's so you know, true, Oppenheimer. Man. But uh, did, did you see either of them, Korea? No, I uh, uh, Lindsay was out of town. I did. Uh, I did have a little bit of the Barbie experience because a buddy of mine, we went to go see uh, Dial of Destiny finally uh, huh. at like an 11 p.m. showing on Friday and the theater was packed with wow. Barbies, uh, everyone <laughs> dressed in pink, like the whole lobby oh, yeah. was filled. Yep. Our screening had like five people in it, but it was just like, oh, oh okay. shit, we are in a Barbie world, aren't we? I- <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, I thought you meant that the Indiana Jones screening was packed, which no. I thought would be odd in that scenario. But yeah, that no, that makes more sense. And yeah, like every time I've been to the movies lately, people are dressing up for Barbie with like pink nightgowns and hats and cowboy outfits. It's It's an event. Yeah, I went to um, I saw Barbie um, because I couldn't see the press screening. I tagged along with my wife and her girlfriends to go see it. So I guess I was the I, I not even the can. I was the Allen to, to their <laughs> um, to their uh, Barbie excursion. But um, I really, really loved Barbie. Um, I liked Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. I loved Barbie. And here's all you need to know about why I loved Barbie. If has strong Josie and the Pussycats vibes. It's Mm. that same type of satire, except instead of taking down consumerism, it's taking down like the patriarchy. And Mm. but it's also, you know, you were talking about Oppenheimer has this existential crisis that he's having. Barbie has some serious existential crisis, too. I mean, if you think about it, it's about these dolls and You know, it's not spoiling too much to say that, like, basically Barbie and Ken go to the real world and um, which is exactly what I was hoping it would be. But once they see the real world, they start questioning their reality of Barbie land. And it um, oh, it was amazing. I freaking loved it. What do you think of Barbie, Jacob? Oh, I loved it. I I thought it was great. And again, amazing ensemble cast from uh, (laughs) Margot Robbie uh, to uh, Kate McKinnon and. Yeah, no, just it was an interesting take on it because, you know, like it, it, it's a movie about Barbie and it go, went surprisingly deeper than that. Like that whole opening 2001 A Space Odyssey parody just blew me away. <laughs> oh, it and is in the movie? That, the, it is, it is in the movie. A, oh, it's the, the very trailer. beginning. Yeah, it, it, and, it echoes 2001 at the beginning. It echoes, echoes the opening scene. It's so hilarious. Ah, oh, fuck me, dude. I Yeah, no, I'm... I. It seems like the perfect level of camp. And someone on Twitter said that this is uh, the closest thing we will get to someone doing a like Richard Altman's Popeye. And as soon as they said that, I went, I know exactly what that movie is. Yep. And I'm beyond pumped for it because I fucking love that Popeye movie. Yeah. No, you, oh, yeah, yeah you, you got to see it. it. It is, it's amazing. It's really, and like, like Jacob was saying, the ensemble cast, Alexandra Ship plays one of the Barbies. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So that was a fun, you know, familiar face michael sarah is alan and oh, he's yeah. an amazing alan but it's funny because the only well, non can you don't realize um it, you have to be of a certain age which i am that a lot of these products were really products that they marketed mm-hmm. towards kids and at one point i i had said to my wife i'm like i'm all i'm a where's earring magic ken oh, and gosh. then sure enough freaking earring magic ken shows up later on (laughs) here's how deep they go because i've been seeing a lot of reaction videos and someone pointed out that they had uh because there was a ken where their outfit was based on like 
80s or 90s like club life which yeah, is that's very oh, yeah. that's an earring magic kid he the, has the a, one with the cock ring it's the, it's the same yeah. one yes that he, has, he one. has a pink mesh shirt and a purple um leather vest oh, and gosh. he doesn't have a cock ring in the barbie no, movie he just, it's the he necklace a, yeah he has a necklace that says um that says barbie and here's the thing and maybe if any of our listeners know what i'm talking about please let us know i remember earring magic ken it, it was put out in like the early 90s and mm. I could have sworn he had a rainbow pride necklace. It was like a chain with these little mm. rainbow loops that form a rainbow. But whenever I look up pictures of him now, it's a necklace that has, I mean, for lack of a better word, a cock ring on it. Whoa. It's oh, well, and, and that's who I, I'll admit I got it from TikTok. I saw it on a TikTok video, but like mm-hmm. it's because like you would have the, the ring, you would wear the ring as a necklace, yeah, you know, yeah. as as like, you know, a sign of that's what you're into and stuff. And so yeah. but because they didn't know that's what it was, they just thought it was a cool necklace thing. They fucking had a, <laughs> they had yeah. a cock ring on it. For us neck. I could have sworn. And if anybody can tell me what, because I've been looking ever since I've ever since I, I kind of went down an earring magic this mm. sounds really weird but i went down an earring magic ken rabbit hole because i could have sworn he had a rainbow pride necklace and it's funny because they were like saying they didn't mean to make earring magic ken the gay ken but it was embraced by the gay community i mean his earring is in the back then the correct ear to be straight i mean so he wasn't but i mean he's wearing a pink mesh top and a purple leather vest i mean what did he do? and he had the cock ring necklace but i could have swore he had a pride necklace so if anybody knows what toy i'm thinking of that was like probably a barbie size male doll i looked at like the new kids in the block the in sync ones the um the vanilla ice the you know the ricky martin dolls and none of them had this but i swear one of them had this pride doll necklace. So if anybody knows what that is, please let me know. Yeah. Because it's driving me mad. Okay. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, uh, I saw Talk to Me yesterday. Oh, oh. yeah. I was, I was going to say, let's move on to something more horror because we talked enough about Barbie yeah, straight and Straight up horror. But yeah. yeah. Let's talk Talk to Me. What did you think? Did you love it or do you love it? Uh, pff, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was quite as scary as a lot of people are making it out to be. I mean, I thought it was scary, but, you know, people, I feel like it's getting a bit of that kind of uh, hype backlash because, I, I mean, I thought it was really scary and it was great. Just, um, yeah, it wasn't as intense as I thought it was going to be, but still, it's an amazing movie and, uh, prob- you know, I just, in general, I think it's an amazing up modern update to the classic, oh, kids are fucking around with Ouija board type yeah. of movie. That's true. Totally, that's what that's what I was saying. It's like a Blumhouse script, but an A24 treatment. It's yeah. yeah like like you said, it's it's a um, because it's not a Ouija board. It's that porcelain. Yeah, hand. exactly. It's a medium yeah. and embalmed medium's hand. But Although, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's the same principle, you know, uh, board kids are messing with the dark arts for a laugh. And of course, it backfires. I want to see more about that hand. I want a prequel about the hand. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Leave one more. Did did either of you guys see the haunted mansion, or I guess oh, it's just haunted mansion? I, I haven't yet. Okay. Oh, you, you yes, see uh, I saw it in 4DX. <laughs> nice. Which let me tell you, 4DX like you're in the ride is like the ultimate like gimmick. <laughs> and I was even sitting there because I Jay, you've talked about it before. Like when they do the 4DX to trailers, it's insane because trailers are mostly action shots. And that happened with the Meg 2. It was just thrashing oh. us around and <laughs> missing us for the entirety of the trailer. It was insane. Jacob, you're coming up to NoHo and we're going to go see it, uh, the Meg 2 and I'm in uh, 4DX in a, in, a, in a week or so. I'm okay. going to convince you. I'm going to convince okay. you. But anywho, uh, I did have a moment like in the first five, because after getting thrashed around and being like oh fuck what did we just get ourselves into two hours of this and then i was like why haunted mansion why are we seeing haunted mansion in 4dx why did we why are we doing this to ourselves and then had the remembrance oh it's based on a park ride so it makes sense to do yeah this and it, it was a lot of fun especially since like with the 4dx yes the chairs move around yes they missed you for some reason they have like a punching mechanism in the back of the chair that just like yeah. is trying to hit every work injury I've ever had in my back. But the my favorite bit is they had a strobe light. So whenever like on, on the upper left corner mm. of the theater, so when lightning struck, it, it would like if it, it felt like old timey, like fucking Corman like theater uh antics. And uh You mean William Castle? Or yeah, William Castle. Castle. There we go. Thank you for uh, correcting. Yeah, me he's on that. the one who put the skeleton in House on Haunted Hill. Yep. But I mean, uh, 
so yeah 40x i think it's worth it with haunted mansion but the film itself is so much fun like as Mm. a haunted mansion ride fan who's obsessed with it and its history like they nailed including all the mythology of it all the different parts of the ride but then they also some of the set pieces felt like oh man this would have been a part of the ride if they could have pulled it off when they (sighs) built the thing uh or was like an extension of it 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 was ah i had so much fun with it. it it's the, mm-hmm. the thing is the people who are disappointed with the Eddie Murphy haunted mansion because it wasn't close enough to the ride. This one pretty much has everything that you could want from the ride in it. Yeah. I mean, and, and I knew that pretty early on in the movie, they look down a hallway and that, and the candlestick is, you know, the ghostly candlestick is going back and forth. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, this is it. This is it. And it only got better from there. They even have references to the doom buggies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, the chair scene. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> but it's, I mean, the plot is pretty, is your pretty stereotypical, you know, haunted house exorcism scene. I mean, you pretty much know where it's going, mm. Yeah. but, um, but just the fact that, it's in this house and you know it just embraces everything about the ride is so much fun the people who complain about like the plot or the story of it being tropey it's like that's fine that's okay to do that yeah. sometimes as it's what you do jump using using that as a jumping off point and that's where mm-hmm. i think it's like okay so yeah it's your typical haunted house exorcism thing but the characters uh everyone seems to be having a blast and on their a game Danny, i feel like danny devito was giving like one scene of dialogue <laughs> he was awesome which was the hibachi scene where he actually like has to explain some like ghost shit and then the rest of the movie is just him just being danny devito unhinged in the scenes because there are yeah, some bits yeah, yeah. there's like one bit where uh lakeith is uh stanfield is giving this really good monologue about his uh dead wife and he's crying and it's like really emotional and he's talking about like she went out to go get tater tots, you know, because she loved tater tots and she was picking up ice cream and, you know, we would go on runs and she'd eat a cheesecake. And then also Danny Vito goes, what was the cholesterol on her, man? Yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> it was perfect. Um, the humor was on point when Jamie Lee Curtis first in the flashback with, yeah. uh, with her outfit. I was living for that moment. Like uh, That's the thing. We got to talk hmm. about the cast of this because Danny oh, DeVito's so in it and then Jamie Lee Curtis plays Madame Leota. So oh. she is like in the crystal ball. But she then um, everything. Jared Leto plays the hat box ghost who's kind of the big baddie. That that and, was that was the only one where I was like, was that necessary? Yeah, well, the thing is, yeah, you can't tell it's him. He's so a, I guess maybe the voice. There's like one picture where it's like, this is what he looked like before he died. And it was Jared Leto, but it's, it's a super cartoon. It's, it's, it's the ghost in the hat box. He looks exactly Mm. like that. And then they modified his voice too. It was one of those things where it's like, what was the point of having Jared Leto? And he, the the, the name Jared Leto, Mm. the name Jared Leto, but that's my only complaint. Lakeith Stanfield and Tiffany Haddish are, and Rosario Dawson. So good. I mean, this cast. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's got an ensemble that almost puts Oppenheimer to shame. No, not really, but it is good. <laughs> mm. I, I think good so. Ensemble, a lot of good <laughs> ensemble cast movies are out right now. <laughs> oh, and, and then the uh, Dan Levy cameo is like yeah, two seconds yeah. long, but he fucking steals it. Him and Danny DeVito in this movie are are have these really good bits where they'll do a joke and then like the scene continues and they're not like in the scene they're off screen and they just say you hear them say something in the background <laughs> and it's the funniest thing ever uh now yeah. i could i could tell you my favorite scene and i don't want to spoil anything so i'm just gonna say the police sketch artist <laughs> that <laughs> is when you when, when that scene is when you see that scene come up it, it, you're gonna die because i did <laughs> so all right well yeah. Um, yeah no i i definitely am gonna try and check it out in 40x like um I'll put some skin on it yeah <laughs> you know get thrown yeah, around like the good. ride and, um and i all as also a cast there's a lot of like names in it but uh the young actor chase w uh dylan yeah, yeah. wow that kid has a future and and that feature is own, that yeah. face. That yeah. kid gives some mm. of the best face reactions to things. Like it, it, right off the bat in the beginning, when the when Rosario Dawson's like, "We're gonna light this vanilla candle and everything's gonna be uh, okay," and he's like, "But is it?" Like, <laughs> oh man, that kid is so good. I I, I really hope he blows up. Did any of you guys get around to um, they clone Tyrone? Yet? Yes, I I did see that at Alamo uh, oh, okay. a week or two back. It's on Netflix now. So did you see it, Korea? 
Uh, not yet. It's on my I, list, though. Yeah, I think you need yeah. to see it because it has real strong "sorry to bother you" vibes. Ooh, so, yeah. so I, yeah, I, I, I pitched it to my friends. I pitched my friends as um, kind of Black Dynamite meets John Carpenter's "They Live." Yeah, it's it's similar. Yeah, it's sold it, but it it has serious "sorry to bother you" vibes because it's like oh, yeah. it, it's basically the setup is th- this this drug dealer gets Played killed by John Boyega. Yeah, by John Boyega, and he gets killed, but then he comes back, and all of his friends are like, "Dude, I saw you die! I saw you die!" So him and a pimp and a um and a a prostitute go investigating this. And I don't want to spoil too much, but there's there's a lot going on, and you could tell they clone Tyrone. You know, he did come back from the dead because you could tell because he's cloned. But there there's some there's it's funny because like it's a serious movie, but there are some parts of it where I'm like where you're just like, come on. Like at one point they're they're going into this lab and, you know, this is getting into spoiler territory, but um, they see a guy like in a suit and they want to go undercover. So uh, his name's Fontaine, Boy- Boyega's character. He goes, he says to this guy in the suit, he goes, where can we get some of those suits? And the next shot you see, they're walking in these suits. It's like, oh yeah, like he's going to just hand those over. <laughs> but but uh, it's, a, it's a trip. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a trip of a movie. And it's a great cast because uh, the pimp's played by Jamie Foxx and yeah. the prostitute named Yo-Yo is played by uh, Teona Paris. Yeah. And nice. yeah, no, they, and just they make a really great uh, tr- uh, trio. And yeah, no, it's just funny because like it does hit on a lot of uh, social satire, black exploitation tropes, uh, conspiracy theories. So it all comes together and <laughs> makes a well, very, you know, very unique movie. Well, and if yeah. you do like, sorry to bother you, Boots Riley's uh, show, I'm a Virgo, is on oh, Amazon yeah, that's Prime, good too. and it is phenomenal. Highly recommend yeah. it. Now, I know you guys, uh, I feel a little more pressured to do the Barbenheimer thing, but I'm busy. I got these two amazing Blu-rays in. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> one I've talked about before, it's the Blu-ray from uh, Oscilloscope uh, for Clay Dream. Uh, it's the documentary about the Vinton Animation Studio. Uh, oh, the okay. Blu-ray is out now, and I can't recommend it enough because they actually have the uh, entire collection of animated shorts. Not not their commercial work, so there's no California Raisins on here. But it's all, right. all their short films on there from Closed Monday all the way through like Christmas gift and the and the little prince uh, just that collection alone is worth it. But the documentary is right. fucking fantastic. And the thing that I, has been almost playing nonstop in our house is uh, uh, the cramps and the mutants at the Napa State tapes. And nice. if, you, if you don't know about this, but back back in the, you know, well, Jay might know a little bit more, but back in the day. During the big punk scene, there were uh, people that were recording all of this. And like, so now there's uh, all these live performances and, and what have you. And now there's um, there's institutes that are uh, restoring and preserving all of these uh, tapes. So uh, the performance is it's the Cramps and the Mutants performing at an actual like state hospital uh, psychiatric ward. And they're just out in the open. It's the smallest stage and it's broad daylight because it was in the middle of the day and they're just performing for the staff, the, you know, the patients and a, a few friends who are apparently on acid. And it is <laughs> great. It's early uh, mm. video. Um, so the quality is here or there. The audio is there, but it doesn't matter because the energy is there. You have uh, patients hopping on the stage and dancing and miming with you know, uh, with the cramps and it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, they have both performances, which were previously only available on like VHS separately. And they're very rare. Uh, these are restored and it includes a documentary, um, that's, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, that's all about, um, what went into that happening because it, mm-hmm. it wasn't just like random, like, you know, they got together, they, it, how it came together, why they did it going into like the history of state hospitals. Cause this was, pre Reagan uh cuz of course yeah. Reagan shut it all down cuz any problem from the last 40 years stems from fucking Reagan yeah. um but it it they have a lot of documentaries and special features about the hospital itself and it's it's if you if you're a punk rocker or into anything rock it's it's a must own uh the cramps and the mutants at Napa State tapes is just ugh. all right uh definitely keep that in mind and speaking of uh Blu-ray uh, releases uh did did either of you watch the venture brothers on adult swim i've seen a few episodes but i never got into it i was always more of a metalocalypse guy fair <laughs> yeah. enough well 
That uh, uh, funny enough, that's going to tie together in a minute. But basically, not, not to draw lines. Like you could be a fan of both. I'm, I'm, I'm just oh saying. yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of both. But uh, yeah, so yeah, both. But but yeah, Venture Brothers. The series got canceled a few years back, uh, but they were allowed to do kind of a final conclusion movie, and it's called The Venture Brothers: Reign Is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. And I've been a fan of the movie for well shit like 20 years and i'm really glad that it was able to get this kind of condensed but still great series finale although they leave it kind of open-ended in case uh they come back in some form but yeah it's fun uh it's it it takes place uh where uh, kind of the last season left off and uh goes into kind of a lot of the deeper lore and kind of characters from the series and it's got Clancy Brown as a supervillain named Red Death, who's like this uh, giant sc- uh, cyborg skull man, which is really cool. And he's also got a cyborg horse named Daisy. Love it. Uh, so that's just and that's just like one facet of the Venture Brothers and this movie in particular. So if you're a fan of the show, I'd recommend that. And leads me to my other point, uh, Metalocalypse, which was also canceled years ago uh is also getting a proper conclusion movie called uh the doomstar requiem yes. which uh i i don't remember exactly when it's coming out but i think it's coming out like next week or so so uh there you go you know, get two series canceled before their time getting proper conclusions well doomstar requiem that was the previous that was the uh opera they did uh, oh years wait you're ago. right uh, the new one is like army of the doomstar Oh, is, Army is of the, the Doomstar. Okay, there was my confusion. Yeah, uh, no, I, I had a moment of like, no, Doomstar Requiem. I'm, I have that entire hour long special memorized. Like, uh, that's not what it's called, but it's something similar. Yeah, I'm so. My I, mistake. No, Metal Eclipse. We're not only getting a movie, but we're also getting uh, Death Album Four. Uh, oh full, yeah, yeah. Full album doing that four. tour. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm so sad that I'm missing. Okay, actually, that's coming out August 22nd. So keep your uh, calendars marked August 22nd for me- Metal Oculus. Oh yeah, I'm sad I'm missing uh, uh, Death Clock and Baby Metal performing in LA. Oh yeah, I want I, I would want to see that. I have good reasons. Apparently, mm. friend's wedding. <laughs> ah, they better appreciate my presence that day. No. <laughs> mm. And now let's bring in our guest. Um, today, we've got uh, Bruce Wemple, who is the writer and director of the upcoming Island Escape. How you doing, Bruce? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, the question I always like to start off with with people is, how did you get started on your on your filmmaking journey? Uh, that's a good question. The I, I don't know if there was like one specific moment or thing. I think it's, you know, it's just a progression of... Uh, different projects and learning experiences and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I went to uh, film school ish sort of program. And then after that I uh, started doing a lot of like training videos and everything. And uh, yeah, the training videos were awesome. Cause you know, it's, it's a lot about making your day and just, you know, you, you get a lot of experience just actually making things and editing and doing and everything. And like each, like anyone will tell you if you do a short film or whatever you're making, it's going to probably be bad. And then you get to, you know, learn from those mistakes and so on. Um, and then it was, you know, fast forward, maybe eight to 10 years after that. And we started, uh, we kind of like got some people together and we made a, uh, a, like an absolutely no budget by no budget. I mean, like maybe a couple grand, but we made a Bigfoot movie called monstrous. And th- like, I was on my rooftop painting like in brooklyn on my rooftop painting a uh, bigfoot costume people were walking out confused why there's like this big furry thing uh we went to the middle of the woods into a cabin shot this bigfoot movie and uh you know we went horror distributor uh dug it and uh they're like you want to make some more with a little bit of cash again not a lot of money but we're like absolutely 100 percent. so we just after that we had a spell of about three um horror movies that we made with the same distributor and then after that it was kind of like, all right, now this is what we're doing. We kind of have a uh, model that we can keep making these fun horror movies. And, you know, there's a little bit of money to be, you know, to spend on it. So we can actually like, it's just making movies. And so that, that that's kind of how where it started, I guess. When you say you went through a, like a film school ish program, um, we've all been through film school. And I think the most valuable aspect of film school is getting your hands on equipment and actually doing it. When you say an ish program, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Did, did you actually get to make movies or was it more of a analysis kind of a thing? 
No, it was one hundred percent a production track. Oh, okay, um, great. I always talk about film school, though. It's it's weird. I think it's what it, you give film school. I think what you get out of it. The I think you can coast by film school without getting that much out of it if you want to. You know, if you go there and and um, but you do have access to all the equipment, and so if you meet the right people and you just want to make things and you just want to learn from that, that that's kind of what I was saying. Um, when I said issue, the program, you know, it was this production track, but there was also pieces of it that were more broadcast oriented and, and, and that kind of thing, but also a lot of uh, film and that kind of production. So it was kind of a wide base net of different video and film production. Um, so that's why I say film school ish. It wasn't strictly like film, film, film. Yeah. Right. Sounds a lot yeah. like my program. It was a lot of like, all right, you got to do that, mm-hmm. but you also got to do your base classes, your sciences, your maths, mm-hmm. and all mm-hmm. that. It's like that's yeah. it. Yeah, it, it sounds a lot like my film school as well, where we would um, if you wanted to work in the TV aspect of it, that, that was there. There's a studio. If you wanted to work in the film, there's all the equipment to check out. I mostly concentrate on sound design. So I was the guy checking out the boom mic and the recorder. Yeah, <laughs> like You know, you, it, it, you're right. It, you get out of it what you put into it. And it's a good way to figure out what you want to do, I think. You know, because there was a lot of guys in my film school who were like, oh, I hate being on set. I just want to write. And then there are the guys who were like, oh, yeah, give me the equipment, you know, (laughs) so. One hundred percent. And you get to, like, collaborate so much without, you know, the the, the very low risk. There's there's no stakes. They just have access to all the gear and you have, you know, actors there because there was also an acting program that you just have all these people available that just want to make things. And you have time, too, to do it. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And. I, I was looking through your letterboxed uh, profile, and I noticed that a lot of your movies uh, involve or revolve around monsters, uh, including your debut with uh, Bigfoot. So I was just wondering uh, if there's any root in that, or uh, do, do you have a particular interest in monsters or something that inspires you? Uh, it's fun. I mean, so I did a movie before that, uh, actually two movies, technically, uh, Altered Hours and Lake Artifact. And again, those were like kind of exactly what I was talking about earlier. A bunch of friends and me going to whether it's a cabin or some sort of location like that. And, you know, my buddy who's a composer ran the audio. I was DPing and directing that sort of thing. Um, Mm. But uh, and then the Bigfoot debut, that was I wanted to make. I was always in love with Bigfoot growing up. And my dad kind of was really into Bigfoot. I remember. Hmm. He had, um, from when he was a kid, just like tons of newspaper articles that he would collect um, about different Bigfoot sightings and everything. So I was always had a curiosity to, to it. But um, so when the chance came, um, a friend of mine actually had written the screenplay and we had a monster and we were like, can this be Bigfoot? And we worked it out and uh, it was super fun. And then from there on, it's like, it's super fun. It's uh, I, I think there's so many stories to tell about with monsters in it around where monsters are in it. And the other thing, like, just from a, I guess, more business side, um, it's really hard to get these movies made um, without, obviously, like, celebrities or movie stars or anything like that. Having a monster, uh, you know, I first of all, I love doing it. But second of all, like, that becomes kind of your headline movie star, if you will, um, mm. the monster in the movie. And so, you know, and there's so many stories to tell around monsters and, and there's just you can go from any which angle you know we've done movies that are like these very serious sort of um you know introspective character studies that also have you know a monster that's pushing the narrative forward and then we have something like island escape which is kind of like a fun bloody shoot him up action sort of thing um and you know it just it's it's fun and it, it it helps these movies you know recoup a budget and and so you know it's great bigfoot is the one uh trope if you will that i never get tired of i love bigfoot <laughs> movies i'll i will watch any bigfoot movie there is so uh, yeah i i love bigfoot um let's talk a little about island escape um where did the genesis for, of the idea come from because it's almost like um when i was watching i was kind of thinking it, it was almost like like a predator kind of a thing where mm. you're sending all of these badasses into this thing but at some point it becomes more than that because the island itself is is mysterious. And I, I don't want to spoil anything because I never watch trailers. And I think that's part of what made Island Escape fun for me is not knowing going in what's going to happen. You know, I, 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 I don't want to spoil anything, but it basically it's basically like Predator, but on a more mysterious scope. There's, you know, there's something else going on. Where did the genesis for this idea come from? 
So the if, if you look back through like the movie I did um, with the uh, before I escaped this movie called The Tomorrow Job, which is a kind of a time travel heist movie, and I, that's always been a fascination of mine, along with monsters. It's just like not sort of time travel as like a big idea, but more of like as a cinem- cinematic thing. And just like, I love any movie that even has a hint of time travel. I'm, I'm game or, or that kind of thing. Maybe it's not time travel. Maybe it's a time loop. Maybe it's a little sort of like Star Trek wormhole sort of whatever that sort of mystery where like, you know, time and the perception of events and stuff is going to be messed with. I'm game. I'm game, whatever it is, you know, and, and the, sometimes they're great. Sometimes the movies aren't good, but it, it's still, if it's going to kind of go into that territory, I'm, I'm very excited. So that was always, you know, an interest. And, and you can see in other movies, we, we've, we've, you know, kind of put our feet in that water, but the, uh, but we knew that we wanted that. And then we also kind of wanted to make it a fun movie. We'd, we'd just made a couple more serious movies and we just like, we, as a crew, we were talking about what kind of movie would all of us want to watch if we were to conclude, if we combine the monsters along with it. And, and we just started talking about these old movies that we, you know, the, the um, almost maybe the John Carpenter, like the escape movies or the um, or Predator, definitely. And, and talking about, you know, those badasses. And like, okay, what if we took that and also gave it a little bit this um, sci-fi cerebral twist to it? And so that's kind of where it started. And then it just kind of expanded from there um, into into kind of escape. Have you seen The Endless by uh, Benson and Moorhead? Yeah, I love it. I I, I was going to say, it it kind of has that, you know, again, not spoiling anything, but it kind of has that same feel. You know, now now we are getting into spoiler territory because (laughs) it's a similar, like, you know, like you said, not really time travel, but time looping. So... I was just, I was just and wondering. This is great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and 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 you know, it's uh, yeah. No, it, I, I, and I think endless was another thing. Like we were talking about the spoilers. Like I didn't know anything going about it going into it. So once it does start getting into that territory, it's very exciting. And and if you don't know it's coming, it's even better. And, and so yeah, that that I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Island Escape uh, hopefully has a little bit of that mysteriousness to it that it, if you don't know the coming if you haven't watched any of the trailers if you haven't, haven't done anything like that it definitely hopefully can surprise you when it does start getting into that more um you know mind bendy territory because it's uh it's it definitely sells itself at least in the beginning as just like this is a shoot 'em up action movie um and, and that was that was the intent is to set it up like you've get the feeling across like oh i've seen this movie before you know i've seen this movie a bunch of badass mercenaries going to an island they're probably all gonna get picked off one by one that sort of feeling to it you know like get the audience comfortable with uh Mm. with that premise and the tropes and everything and then once they're settled into that then start introducing these other mind-bending sort of concepts start getting I, into star trek territory but without <laughs> adding super complicated scientific words in front of stuff right <laughs> did, did a great job of avoiding the it's like the quantum blah 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 oh you mean like a slingshot yeah mm. <laughs> as someone who didn't watch the trailer and just dove right in i think uh you did a great job of that i mean because i because when it started i was just like okay this is you know this is predator where's the monster and, and then as it unfolds what's happening i'm like oh wait a minute <laughs> you know, there, there, there were there were a lot of wait a minute moments in this. You yeah. know, you're like, wait, OK, wait, until you figure out what's going on. You're like, wait a minute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome that yeah you got that experience, because like I think, you know, it's hopefully we get other people that are just, you know, able to watch it completely, you know, no knowledge of anything. It's hard to do, though. And that's really hard to do right now. With, right. Uh, you know, how do you find a movie? Um without that but if if that can happen that that's awesome so i always make a point of doing that you know i don't watch trailers you know i i love going in cold so i would say you know what the worst is i i was i just remember whenever it came out last year we we went and saw the batman and my buddy had avoided every single trailer leading up every every we sat down and they had this like five minute promo for the movie (sighs) right before the start of the movie and he was just yeah, like ridiculous. head in hands. I'm like, why are they doing this? You know, like, they... <laughs> uh, 
I, I hate that, especially when I've been avoiding trailers and then I go to the movies and it's like, no, wait, the trailer is playing now. I can't avoid it. Uh, or, yeah, Evil Dead, I had to I had to limit myself. I was like, all right, we can only watch the trailer for Evil Dead Rise once or twice and that's it. We can't watch it anymore. Like, let's get, our, let's get a taste of it. Forget about it for months. For Hereditary, I didn't want to know a dang thing about that movie going in. And I learned what the beginning of the trailer looked like, because this was also the fat years of movie pass. So I was going to the movies all the time. And when I would see that a 24 that I knew was hereditary, I would go to the restroom and I would come (laughs) back. (laughs) You know, I'm like, I do not want to see this trailer. This movie's going to be too good. And I, and I just actually came from seeing Oppenheimer and they had the trailer for the new exorcist movie, which uh, I mean, I was interested in seeing, but at the same time as like, yeah, they showed probably a bit too much in that. So it's a double, real double edged sword. But I do got to yeah. say, for Island Escape, uh, it does show a little bit more of like the, the, you know, the after Predator bits, but like there, there was still plenty to go, oh, oh shit. Okay. Like I definitely, <laughs> especially getting towards the end, I'm like, how is this going to work out? What? Wait. A, and then like something else came up and I'm like, oh, wait, shit. That's right. Because of this. Oh, got me. So like if there's if you've seen the trailer. You haven't seen everything for this movie. Just just know that. <laughs> yes, I awesome. agree. I agree. There, there's there's a lot left. It, it's 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 tough. Yeah, I have just one. more. I went and saw Mission Impossible last week and I remember there were not one but two making of featurettes before the movie. Mm-hmm. of scenes in the movie which again i loved the movie but i'm like this is way more than i wanted to see before actually just just wa- sitting down and watching yeah. the movie clean before you watch <laughs> this movie for the first time in theaters let's show you a making of of all the big action sets that you're about yep. to see yep. completely <laughs> spoiled <laughs> it's like dude no like after let's do an after thing yeah i know i know and something else I wanted to ask, uh, I noticed that a lot of the cast have been in uh, previous movies you've done. So uh, I was wondering if uh, like they're friends of yours or it's just you've kind of assembled a kind of family cast or, or like cast that has become a family to you and that you, you've you been working with them several times. Yeah. It, uh, so all of them I met via some sort of acting sort of like either you know they audition for something from or, or something like that they're all you know and then since then you know we've become friends but i think for me it's it's you know we're never working with huge budgets at all or not even even you know they're always really small so it's i love the idea when we get on set we're trying to outdo whatever we did from the previous movie and mm-hmm. it's easier to do that when you know you have someone who's been in the trenches with you before um, of the previous movie set and especially you know if they're good through all they're good actor and you know you know you have this shorthand that's getting better and better so yeah any chance i can to to bring them into another movie if uh I, i'll take just because you know we're, we're just trying to outdo ourselves that's all you can really do on these movies it's just it's, try to do your best work and try to outdo whatever movie you did or whatever work you did before that and they're great and and so you know it's it's they get on set and they we all kind of know what's expected of each other and how we're going to, you know, approach this and how we're going to make it. And, and we all stick together. And it, that's what it's like. Yeah, like you said, it's a little bit like a family, like a, almost like a whole sports team too, I would call it like hmm. the way, you know, we're all supporting each other and we're all there to just, you know, make the best thing we can possibly make. And, and no one's there just for themselves. So that's really kind of the, the, the mentality behind that. No, having cool. having kind of like a family or a team, as you say, of people that you work with repeatedly, do you find yourself writing for specific actors? Like when you wrote Island Escape, did you think, okay, this part would be perfect for so and so, and this part's for so and so? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this project specifically, um, the uh, I started putting the pieces together, and, and I, I knew the knew the tone I wanted, and then as I was, I was like, okay, so and so would be perfect for that. That would be perfect, and then. I didn't know if they were all going to be available, but I, I'm pretty sure for that main group of mercenaries, it was first choice of like the people I knew for every single one. Like, and, and so that was really fun because they was already kind of in their voices. Um, it was, you know, it was written for them. So yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you don't get that, or sometimes you're like, this is a part that we just don't have, or, you know, we, we maybe have overdone this thing with this person a little bit, something like that. that that's happened sometimes, but for this one, I, I, 
I also knew it was going to be a hard shoot. There's a number of things in there, uh, uh, stunt esque sort of things, and also like there's a, you know, there's a fight on top of a mountain, which I knew the only way to get to that was, you know, the cast and crew had to hike up a mountain. There was certain things I'm like, I can't have someone brand new that I'm not sure is going to, you know, be game for these sort of things, um, especially with the budget we had and everything. We didn't have a lot of time, so I needed to make sure whoever were bring in was was ready to do that sort of stuff so um but yeah i i, I totally write for those people when, I, when i'm doing it yeah i definitely want to talk about the filming location um where you guys shot because there is a like you said there's a fight on top of a mountain you're in the woods a lot there's ocean shots what was what was that experience uh like and where, so, did, you, where did you guys film it uh a lot of it was filmed around the uh upstate new york um kind of adirondack adirondack region um, I'm originally from upstate New York and, and so, uh, we, but it was a number of different places just because like you said, there, there's the kind of more ocean, um, islandy stuff. And then once we're in the woods and the mountains, so we kind of had to split it up a little bit. Um, the, uh, I, <laughs> we were getting into production. We knew like it was all happening. Um, I don't want to spoil, but there, there's a set piece at the end involving a boat and it is, I guess, <laughs> Someone is going to escape the island, but like, you know. <laughs> it's I was actually island. wondering. I was wondering about that stunt. Was was that actually a practical stunt? Oh yeah, everything. Yeah, there, I mean, <laughs> not the not the sky, obviously, but other yeah. than that, yeah, um, yeah. So that was crazy. Uh, the so, but the thing was, we knew we were shooting it, and it was about near early September. We we're like, okay, we're making the movie. We, the, 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 the money was in place and, and the people were in place, everything. So we're like, okay, pre-production starting. We'll, we'll shoot in um, late October, November, that time of year. Cause I really also just love the look of the leaves changing everything. It's, it's, it's cool. But we realized we can't do that stunt in November. That's insane. The water is going to be, you know, freezing and people, you know, we, so we're like, okay, we have to do that. We have to get that in the can first. So that was actually the first thing we shot was that set piece at the end um and we it, it was a blast i mean everyone was gaming and everything was safe but it was wild when i'm in one boat with the long lens shooting into the other boat and we're both kind of going parallel to each other um and they're you know they're having the fight on the eye on the on the boat and and then third it, 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 it was very chaotic and it was super fun the uh and then you know we're doing the the, the boat drags and you know the, the it's, it's a combination of a, it, it was it was pretty intense especially for like okay this is how we're starting a shoot which is the first thing and the good it was honestly though a relief to get that in the can and then like we're like when we cut it together like okay this works we have this this is like probably the hardest thing we're gonna do um and so getting that done was 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 fun but it was it was definitely a, a weird way to start the shoot you, you know first day uh two people sitting across from a table having a chat. That's what you want on the first day. It's like that <laughs> sort of do over the shoulder as a wide shot, be done with it. Go, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's when you say to day. him, you're like, all. Oh, it's only going to get easier from here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Start, start so you say like, that. If you're still with me now, we're going to be good for that. Yeah. If, you're, if you haven't <laughs> left already, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the major pain thought process, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you think that that hurts? Okay, cool. Now we can move on because it's not going to hurt as much. as. <laughs> after that. I swear, Jonathan, you will take any opportunity to bring up the movie Major Pain. <laughs> Yes. Yes. That movie has had a profound effect on me. <laughs> um, I'm back on uh, Monsters. I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, who who did the practical effects or how you kind of went into the designs. Yeah, we actually went through a couple different phases. We uh, that actually that first shoot, we had one makeup artist um, and, and she did a great job. But it just once we kind of got into the edit, we're like, this this isn't quite what we're going for. And it, it was just, we knew, we knew at that point we had to shift the look a little bit. Mm. Um, and uh, just because it, it just, I, we kind of all realized like, and this has to be bloodier, crazier. It has to have that, that texture of just like that, that feeling of, of just not only the prosthetics, not only the eyes, not only all of that, but it's just got to look bigger and just kind of blood soaked the whole time. Just, just as a, we, we, we got to that. So we ended up having, we went through a, couple different phases and different artists that kind of came in and out but uh jesse hadrock um actually came on at the end and, and i hadn't, hadn't i worked with her 
like 2015 on a different project. And uh, we just kind of, she did her, her thing. And then we're looking for a new makeup artist. And uh, she posted an Instagram, literally like the second we're like trying to like scan for like different people. And I was like, Oh, I forgot about this. Girl. So I gave her a call. Cause she was, uh, I knew she was somewhat local to the area we were shooting and she's like, yeah, I'm available. So that was actually, that came together very quickly. And then once we, uh, once we kind of figured out, okay, there were the prosthetics, everything, the, the muscle suit, all of that. And then just kind of making sure the blood soaking was always there. There was always some sort of drop, something dripping off of them mm -hmm. at all times to add that chaos, which in hindsight, I didn't realize how complicated for the prosthetics was going to be because those, some of those prosthetics tend to soak up water, soak up blood a little bit. So there was a little, some complicated, it was very complicated, obviously, because hmm. again, these, this is spoilers, but um, there's a, several scenes where you have a monster version and a human version of the character that actually have to interact, fight, whatever it is. So that, you know, that, 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 it, created a number of headaches on set that we had to kind of work around but, mm -hmm. you know. now did you use the same actors for that or were there doubles i mean was there camera um, trickery that you have to have somebody fight themselves yeah we tried to use every trick in the book just to kind of not you know make sure it doesn't always feel like it's one same what the same trick so there's a couple comp shots in there where you know you have the the two which took some planning and then there are doubles that we had pretty much for every i mean some of the doubles switched over to different actors but every actor had some sort of double um for certain shots and uh yeah and then some of it is just you know eye lines and you're just making you having to keep track okay with that you were staring there and then once we do switch the makeup that they have to be standing in whatever position to match up the eye lines and just making sure it all cuts together um some of the scenes what was actually helpful was uh we would actually do film the whole fight set piece whatever it was quickly get the dailies into you know editing and then cut together a version of it really as fast as we could just like a very rough assembly of it and so we could identify exactly where the the spots were that we needed our monster coverage and shoot a little based on that plus a little extra but that, that was actually a, a really helpful tool was to having those edits done really quickly and we could you know have the text placeholders or whatever there and then we could you know, be shooting the monster with a little more intention, you know, then because it, it, it gets tough when you're having to remember, okay, so-and-so is standing there for that scene and everything. Cause also it's, it's a few hours in a makeup chair. So you, it, there's a lot of planning involved when, when it comes to that. Yeah. The beauty of digital cinema, you can watch the dailies very quickly. And <laughs> yeah. Well. Oh yeah. I yeah, know <laughs> we, uh, we were not sending this to a lab or anything. This was, <laughs> yeah. This was instant on the, on, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if you could have done that, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Well, it, it looks great. I'm sure the actors had a lot of fun playing those multiple versions as well. Go do being able to do flip sides. There was a I again don't want to spoil too much about the about the uh uh doubles and whatnot, but there was definitely like an animalistic, like primordial like energy to them that was very it was very fun, <laughs> mm. especially yeah. dripping and everything. Yeah. And it's got to yeah. be fun to be able to fight yourself. You know, it, mm -hmm. you know, w when they look at the finished product, they're like, oh, yeah, that's me kicking the crap out of myself. <laughs> 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 Again, very Star Trek. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always think Brady Bunch when I see that, uh, <laughs> that, that double thing. I always think, you know, you know, Peter with the Dracula see it's parent Weird. trap for me i'm like parent <laughs> yeah no i was thinking of that one star trek where kirk got an evil uh transporter clone of himself and could tell he was evil because he like would do that shifty eyes thing and the camera would zoom on him and then he fought himself <laughs> oh i haven't gotten to that one yet i did just uh, get the one where <laughs> they found a it was a second Riker. that was a fun episode oh well that was tng I, yeah I, yeah that, sure. look there's a lot of cloning in star trek yeah. Oh, you're talking about original series. Sorry. Yeah, I was talking about Kirk Shatner. Uh, yeah, I spaced out. I'm a, I'm a huge next gen. Kid. We we said <laughs> that we weren't. Gonna, I wasn't allowed to bring up Trek anymore on this. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't remember saying that. Yeah, I didn't say that either. <laughs> we've been uh, we've been next gen binging lately. Uh, we we had a newborn like uh, 12 weeks ago. So, oh, congrats. Uh, thank you, thank you. And so my wife and I 
uh, pretty much TNG was on the TV constantly. Um, so <laughs> nice. we've, been, we've been binging a lot lately. <laughs> you you got to start them off early. You got to get those, you know, the Starfleet know, morals. Know, and sure <laughs> they got to know that the first duty of every officer is to, t- is to the truth, right? You know, yes. so, <laughs> I love the prime directive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Bruce, thanks for joining us this, uh, this morning. Um, the movie Island Escape, um, it, the theatrical is uh, next weekend, which is the weekend after this post, but VOD is on the 8th, correct? On August 8th? Yes, correct. Yes. So the day after this post. So if you're one of the, one of our subscribers and you listen on the first day, uh, Island Escape will be on VOD the next day, on Tuesday the 8th. Um, where can people uh, keep up with – do you have the social media if people want to keep up with what you're doing next? Sure. I have uh... – Bruce M. Wemple on Instagram, I guess, would be the best spot. Um, or uh, 377 Films on Instagram, too. That that has more strictly just uh, the whatever projects we're working on, some that kind of stuff. So um, either one of those, um, check it out. Great. Um, as for us, uh, you can find us um, at Eye on Horror on all of the socials. Um, actually, iHorror.com. You can also find us there and they need some help with Twitter. I guess the Twitter guidelines have changed and they need subscribers and they're doing some mm. cool contests. So any of you listeners who want to uh, win some cool stuff, uh, head on over to iHorror on Twitter. Um, are our we eligible? Theme, I, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if we are or not. Um, Jacob themes, isn't. He's, he'll uh, win automatically. <laughs> he, would, he would win if he was. Uh, <laughs> I tried. Our theme, our theme song is by Restless Spirit, so go give them a listen. And our artwork is by Chris Fisher, so go give him a like. And um, go and watch Island Escape. Um, so uh, that the, the writer-director, Bruce Wimple, thanks again for joining us. And uh, we will see you all in a couple of weeks. So for me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. I'm Jonathan Korea, And I'm Bruce Wimple. Keep your eye on horror.